Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Del Mar on this beautiful February morning. We're very glad to have you with us in worship today, whether you're here in person or joining us via live stream. Uh, we are confident that God's Spirit transcends time and space. So even if you're uh, joining us in worship later on during the week, as I know some folks do when they're traveling and doing other things, we, we trust that you're here with us at the same time in spirit. Call your attention to the announcements uh, that are found in your bulletin. Um, especially want to point out uh, one particular thing. Uh, we have the Helping Neighbors with Housing Initiative. Uh, that is to uh, hopefully house a immigrant family, a migrant family in the, the uh, Seven Nathaniel uh, property that we have. The church owns right next to the parking lot. And uh, Paul Kehoe and um, also the Chris's will be doing a presentation downstairs. Um, uh, following worship, following fellowship time, you'll have an opportunity to get some coffee and, and visit just a bit, and then you can uh, uh, gather on the uh, stage end of the fellowship hall for a brief presentation. I think that it's mostly about giving you enough information so that you can then uh, have your questions answered, and, and uh, so we're uh, especially uh, concerned that we uh, get all the information that you need to, uh, to support this wonderful initiative and great opportunity that we have and uh, to fund that so that we're able to, uh, to do that. So uh, please do join us for that, uh, especially if you're somebody who has questions or would like more information. Um, and also so that you'll be educated so you can spread the word and share information with your fellow church members and even others in the community as well. Um, just uh, want to make sure you read all the other announcements are there. The only thing I'm going to mention is that uh, Ash Wednesday is coming up. Uh, actually, I have two more things to mention. One is that Ash Wednesday is coming up. Uh, not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday on Valentine's Day. I saw a meme from the, uh, I think it was uh, Indiana Conference, maybe, of United Methodists that said you can't have Valentine's without Lent. Think about that, right? So, um, so uh, yes, it is Valentine's Day, but uh, we'll be having a uh, potluck dinner and then uh, worship. So potluck dinner at 6 on uh, Ash Wednesday and then um, a service following at 7 in the chapel. So uh, we hope you'll join us for that. And then following Wednesdays, uh, we plan to have a light meal and then uh, some kind of a program or presentation on Wednesdays uh, uh, with different kinds of topics. And one of those uh, presentations or one of those events actually is also going to be, uh, we're going to be hosting the Kenyan College Choir um, here on Wednesday, March 6th. And so uh, watch for more information about that. 6th. March 6th. March 6th. March 6th. No, March 6th. So, uh, so we're going to be doing that, and um, one of the things we're going to need for that is housing for the uh, college choir members. Uh, so watch for information, and uh, so you can help with that opportunity as well. The other thing is, I will not be here next Sunday. Um, I will be up at Winter Carnival in Saranac Lake, and our preacher next Sunday is going to be Heather Smith, who's shaking her head. She, she's going to be your preacher for next Sunday. So she will be here, um, and uh, I will be away. So uh, that's all the announcements, so let us center our hearts and minds for worship.
heart. Amen. The heart is the end of wisdom. Glory be to the one whose wonders are to be remembered. Amen. The heart is the end of wisdom. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Amen. The Lord is the end of wisdom. The Lord feeds the righteous with truth. Hear the Lord. <laughs> Come, let us give thanks to God. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn. All the four thousand tongues we sing is found in our reading worship and song. Page 3001. Can we have a cipher? So while Jeff's getting set up, um, I'll just make a mention about this. Um, of course, you know the text. It was written by Charles Wesley, and for years it was the first hymn in our hymnal. It was hymn number one. Um, then when the new hymnal came out in 1989, first thing my grandfather did was split to number one to make sure that um, oh, 4,000 Tongues was there, but it's not number one in the current hymnal. It's number 57. And he was like, what have they done? But it's still the first hymn. It just happens to be number 57. Uh, but this uh, tune for this was written by Mark Miller, and um, you'll notice the tune name often at the bottom, I don't know if you know that, um, is called Asmon's Ghost. The tune that we sing of 4,000 Tongues to in the traditional version is called Asmon, so that's why Mark called this hymn tune Asmon's Ghost. <laughs> Forgive us, yes, make us new, remove our 
So it says, uh, I was, it says, let it be known that Stephen Mitchell Smith has been ordained elder and is a member of the Order of Elder in the United Methodist Church. And that was in Troy Conference in 2002 in Burlington, Vermont, and it was signed by the bishop, who's Bishop Susan Morrison, who is sometimes still referred to in our house as the real bishop. So she was awesome. And she kind of, it was because of her that Troy Conference, one of our slogans kind of was, be bodacious. Yeah, that's the kind of person she was. But the, one of my favorite things that I have in my office was given to me by folks from one of the churches I served. And it's, there were um, four families in that congregation who were from Ghana in West Africa. And when I left there, they gave me this plaque that says, do you see what that's going to be? You can be. <laughs> You're not going to read for me? Just the top part. For promoting diversity and inclusion. So the, 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 what's that? No, it's from 2021. Yep, no. So, so that was from folks in my congregation, and they also gave me this stole. So, um, which is kente cloth, and it's from God. Right? You like that? Is that cool? So, and normally I wouldn't, see, this is one of those things, because kente is actually something that, for people in West Africa, has a you know, special meaning to them. And I've talked before, I've worn this, and I've talked about this symbol here, which is called a, a gaine. Yeah, so which means um, not above. It represents God. It means no one above God, right? So... So it's, um, but I, I feel like I, it's okay for me to wear it because it was given to me by the people from, um, from that community who were my friends, people from West Africa who wanted me to have this to wear. Otherwise, I wouldn't have necessarily just gone out and bought it because that really wouldn't have been appropriate because it's not part of my culture. But it was given to me by the same folks who gave me that certificate because they wanted to share their culture with me and, and be connected in that way. So I'm talking about that partly because <clears throat> February is beginning of Lent, yes. Valentine's Day, there's something else that happens in February, Ash Wednesday, not a churchy thing, something else, that is a church thing, there's something else, what's that? Black History Month, thank you, choir. So, <laughs> it's Black History Month, right? So we have... Well, see, and that's why I'm here to remind you. So, um, it, Black history is is a is an important part of our United Methodist history too, and um, we have sort of a mixed history, like our country does, of our relationship with Black folks, with African American folks. So, we have um, sometimes in the church there were people that actually supported slavery. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was very opposed to slavery. But there were some people in the church who did support slavery, and who actually, there were uh, pastors and bishops who owned slaves. Um, so that's something that we're, we mourn, that's something we, we regret. Um, and in the United Methodist, the Methodist Episcopal Church was called at the time, actually separated before the Civil War, before our country separated, the Methodist Church separated over the issue of slavery. Because was that's how strong the disagreement was. At the Civil War, when this, when, when a whole bunch of states separated, yeah, tried to separate from the country, yeah. <clears throat> so before that happened, it, the Methodist Church actually split too. So there were things like that, and even before that, there were churches where um, people, if you were, uh, uh, if you were African American, if you were black, you weren't allowed to go up for re to receive communion until everybody else had gone up first, and you were required to sit in the back or maybe in the balcony. And you um, sometimes couldn't go up and kneel. Um, I actually um, was in seminary, and so this was only, say, not quite 30 years ago that I started seminary. Um, I had a classmate who served at a church where there was still people that remembered when, if you were black, you weren't allowed to go up and kneel at the altar to receive communion. You had to receive communion in a separate spot. So there were a lot of things like that that happened in our church. But there were also lots of folks who were um, prominent in the civil rights movement and marched with Dr. King and John Lewis and people like that. And um, there were people like Fred Shuttlesworth, who was a, a 
United Methodist pastor who were really important in the civil rights movement. So we have this kind of mixed history of things that have happened. So um, it's really important for us to learn about that, and we'll talk about that more um, a little bit throughout this month, and, um, and learn a little bit, and then um, how we can be uh, mindful of that as we're doing church. But one of the things I love here is we have a, a pretty diverse church, and we're getting more diverse all the time. And that's a really, really good thing, because um, we look like the world, right? God created people to all look different, and um, it's really nice when the church looks a lot more like God's creation. Right? All right, let's have a prayer before you guys get to Sunday school. Wonderful God, we thank you for all the different ways that you made us. We thank you that there are people who speak different languages and live in different cultures, wear different clothes, people who view the world in different ways. And we thank you that there are people who look different too. Help us as we are trying to be the church you want us to be to welcome and celebrate all the many different people that you've created. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up. We were on the phone yesterday morning with uh, Heather's sister who lives out in Arizona, and uh, she was talking about, you know, she moved there back in September, and uh, still getting settled in some ways, and has found a uh, synagogue out there, uh, Rayon, Heather's sister is Jewish, and uh, uh, found a synagogue out there where she likes to worship, and one of the things that she was telling us about, in addition to a uh, local connection that she made, she met a woman who's actually originally from Slinger, Slingerlands, um, so we should take piano lessons here at the Methodist Church. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that she was telling us about was that they were uh, got a presentation uh, there that uh, that Friday about um, uh, immigration and uh, the ministries there in her community um, to uh, welcome migrants and uh, to do that important work. And it was really great to be able to uh, talk and brag about the many ways in which our congregation uh, is uh, involved in welcoming migrants and refugees and uh, the ways in which we've been able to connect with people, not just to collect some stuff or donate some money, but the personal relationships we've made. And I think uh, that's an incredibly important thing because I know that uh, when you hear the stories, when you meet people, when you see the smiles on the faces of children, when you interact with them, when you get to sit in color, when you're here for a meal, uh, or whether you uh, spend the night and see how people are people, and uh, the, the, the sense of personal relationship is so incredibly important. And so I'm grateful for that, and I hope you are too. And I, I hope you, uh, I hope you uh, find more opportunities uh, as we engage in ministries with Rise and uh, USCRI, and uh, through our own furnishings ministry, other things like that, um, to uh, to build relationships and uh, to meet people. The ushers will assist us as we gather tithes and offerings.
please join with me in the prayer of dedication. For earth, which you have molded, for creatures and animals, plants, water, air, and fire, for Jesus who died and rose again, for the breath of life, we give you thanks, O God. Let these gifts be used for good, wherever there is need, in the name of all that you have first given us, especially Christ Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able as we sing together. Let us join together in the prayers of the community. 
Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Hear us, O God, and your mercy is great. For the healing of earth and all its creatures, hear us, O God, and your mercy is great. For the church's willingness to cast out demons in its midst, for congregations that are in turmoil, for the healing of divisions between the followers of Christ Jesus, hear us, O God, and your mercy is great. For leaders of nations, for those who have great wealth, for those who have too much power, for those who have destructive weapons, and for those who have none. Hear us, O oh God. For those who are victims of others' idolatry, for children who have no one to listen to their cries for food and shelter, for parents who cannot answer the needs of their children, for peacemakers and diplomats, for those who give through charities, and for those who use the law to make policies for the greater good. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For the prayer concerns of this community, which we lift up to you now. For all those who work quietly behind the scenes, supporting the ministries of our congregation. For those who are struggling to find healing in bodies, minds, and hearts. For all those who are in recovery. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. For the wisdom to fear you rightly, the power to withstand changes in our own lives that bring us closer to you, for the ability to give thanks for the people who have brought us to this time, our ancestors, teachers, pastors, and the martyrs of every age, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Into your hands we commend all those for whom we pray, and those it would be easy to forget. We ask your blessing on all your people, that we may come at last to the truth around your banquet table that has no end. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Gospel lesson comes to us from the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. We continue where we have been, beginning with verse 21. We rise as you are able to hear the gospel. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. Suddenly there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook him and screamed, and then it came out. Everyone was shaken and questioned among themselves, What's this, a new teaching with authority? He even commands unclean spirits, and they obey him. Right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. One thing about Mark's gospel is Mark, as we know, moves through the action really quickly. But that's partly because he's trying to impart to us a sense of urgency and immediacy, a sense that something exciting is happening. Actually, in verse 21, right at the beginning there, a lot of translations have dropped the word that is there, which says basically the same thing it says right after that, immediately, right away. Right away, Jesus and his followers went in to Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. 
And then notice it says, the people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. There was something different about this person who was teaching them. But what really stands out to me here is the fact that they really don't recognize who is in their midst. And in fact, it's an evil spirit in their midst that it says, screams out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Jesus then rebukes him. That's one of those great churchy words we get to use occasionally. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook him and screamed, then it came out. Everyone was shaken and questioning among themselves, what's this? A new teaching and authority. He even commands unclean spirits and they obey him. They're more caught up in the fact that he was casting out this unclean spirit from the man than recognizing exactly who he was. And it was in fact the voice of the unclean spirits which gives us as the reader a sense of clarity about who Jesus is. Just before this, he had called some of his disciples. Remember on the lake shore. He passed along. And there were Simon and Andrew, and then James and John. And he invited them to follow. And it says immediately they did. And then he goes and has this encounter in the synagogue. But still, people aren't grasping the fullness of what is happening. Okay, yeah, it's in the first chapter. Things are just starting. But they're marveling not at who Jesus is, but at what is happening. Often, for a lot of us, it's hard to fathom this idea that Jesus is right now, even in our midst. It's hard to fathom this idea that when Jesus comes into the world two millennia ago, the people are told that the kingdom of God is nearby, is at hand, is really close, is immediate. The kingdom of God is close by. It's at hand. It's immediate. You can smell it. You can almost taste it. You can touch it. It's like when you walk into a room and you can tell that dinner is almost ready. <clears throat> or like the year that the parsonage oven broke down and I cooked my Easter ham in the church kitchen oven. <coughs> and in that church, the kitchen was right below the sanctuary. About halfway through worship, it smelled really good. <laughs> Easter dinner was at hand. It's like that. But it's in an unexpected place, in an unexpected voice, in an unexpected way that people get a glimpse, get some clue about what is happening, about who Jesus is. All they know is there's something different about the way that he is teaching them. It's not like the scholars that they've heard. It's not like the people who can stand there and say, this is what Scripture says, these are the rules, this is what all the rabbis and others throughout the years have written, this is what it means. But it lacks a certain something. You can read a catechism, you can read a creed, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything to you if you don't have the experience. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, struggled with that very thing. He studied at Oxford. After having grown up the child of a clergy person, a clergyman in the Church of England, and his mother taught him at home, she herself, the, the daughter of an Anglican priest, he was well-schooled, well-educated, but he knew that there was something lacking. 
For him, it was in unexpected encounters with a group of Moravians on a ship in a storm where he saw something in them that he then followed up on and had finally his experience in a Bible study on Aldersgate Street in London. Where he felt his heart strangely warmed. And it was in unexpected people, in unexpected places, and in unexpected times that he finally had those encounters that he longed for. But he had seen a glimpse, and he knew there was something more. A transformative experience of God's Spirit. In the passage we heard in that read, it talks about raising up Prophets raising up people to share who God is, to share something of the Word of God, of the experience of God. So, who are those people? Where are those places? When are those times when you've had those experiences that you just didn't expect? Who are the voices that caught you off guard? One of the other treasures I have in my office is a statue of St. Jude that my daughter Jane bought me for my birthday, I think. I know it came from Jane. I'm pretty sure she gave it to me for my 55th birthday last year. And she gave it to me because she knows I have a fondness for St. Jude, in part because there was a small child at one of the churches that I served in a time of great stress and, frankly, drama in the life of the church. I know that's never happened here. <laughs> but in some churches, there's times of conflict and drama, and people get upset, and they say things that you really wouldn't expect people to say or do in church. And people were divided, and people were fighting, and I had a man five minutes before worship one Sunday tell me that maybe they just needed to get rid of the pastor. <laughs> well, see, he was upset because it was a chance that we might have to lose the organist. And if you don't have organ music, it's not church. He and I disagreed on that. <laughs> I love organ music, but... And in the midst of that, the small child in the congregation came and gave me this medallion of St. Jude that he had gotten from somewhere, and he wanted me to have it. St. Jude is the saint, patron saint of impossible causes, lost causes. And so in the midst of all of that drama and trauma, in the midst of people fighting, in the midst of what seemed like something impossible to overcome and to walk through, in this unexpected place, from this unexpected voice, who really didn't understand the significance of what he was offering to me. And yet maybe he did. I found hope. Again and again in the life of the church, there have been people who in the midst of things do sometimes very small things. Like walk past me on a weekday morning when there's all kinds of conversations going on about church business and lots of different things and just say, hey, you're doing a good job. Or sometimes just liking a certain Facebook post, which can speak volumes. People who engage at times when you most need to hear that or who sometimes say things in the midst of a meeting that catch you off guard and make you think differently. At one congregation, I remember sitting in a meeting where we were talking about how we were going to utilize some extra funds that we had. And we wanted to allocate them to mission, but there was some disagreement about where that should go. And one woman, who was sort of a matriarch of the congregation, spoke up, and she said, 
I think we should support domestic ministries here in our own country because it's important for us to take care of our own. I didn't hear that well. But I knew that I was not the right person to respond. And so I just waited. And there was this sort of uncomfortable silence in the moment. When one of our Ghanaian members, so now you know what church it was. So one of our Ghanaian members, who was at that time the chair of the church council, finally spoke up. And in a very gracious way, because that's the kind of person he is, said, there are many times throughout the world where the United States steps up, reaches out, responds, does things for other people. So yes, I th think we should at this time, in this moment, direct this aid, direct this resource that we have to help people here in our own country. And I went, it didn't need to come from me. In fact, it was better than it didn't. It came from a person in the midst of the congregation who was part of that community in a different way than I can be as pastor, who had a longer relationship and a sense of trust, and out of his own sense of who he was, offered healing and grace. It wasn't a deeply wounding moment, but offered a sense of healing and grace in what was becoming an uncomfortable conversation. Who are the people? When are the times? Where have you encountered God in an unexpected moment, in an unexpected way? Deeply and profoundly. Are there moments when you've been the person who's been able to do that? Are there moments when you've hesitated and wished you had said something because you had a sense of where God might be leading us in that moment. The people were gathered with Jesus and listening to him teach. Listening to him teach, and they had a sense that there was something bigger and different than they had ever experienced before, but they still didn't quite get it, and it was through this unclean spirit, this evil that had consumed someone in their midst, that we and they get just a little bit better understanding of who Jesus really is and was. I encourage you. I invite you. I might even implore you to listen, to be open, to be open to the voices that are coming, but be open to the fact that maybe, maybe there are moments in the life of the church, in the life of the community, in the places in the world where you go, where maybe God is raising you up. To be a voice for hope, for healing, for reconciliation, for peace. Maybe you're the person enough detached from the situation to have a different kind of perspective. Or maybe you're the person who stands in just the right place to build a bridge. Where there is otherwise division. Is God raising you up to be a prophet? To be a teacher with a different kind of authority? 
to be a voice of hope in our world. Our communion liturgy is found on the inserts in your bulletin. Remember Christ and put 
This is Christ's table, and you are invited. Everyone is invited who wishes to come and receive of these gifts that represent God's grace, Jesus' offering to us. We receive by invitation, or there are some small cups if you prefer. We invite you to come forward as directed by the bishops.
Thank you. 